Hello and welcome to Conspiracy Theories, part of the Citizen Literacy Workshop series here at Cal Poly Pomona. On the afternoon of January 6, 2021, an abortive insurrection stormed the United States Capitol and attempted to halt the certification of the electoral vote that would make Joe Biden the 46th President of the United States. The insurrectionists were a varied group, including militia groups, white nationalists, and other extremist groups. Among all these groups were a significant number of individuals who participated in the storming of the Capitol for more than political reasons. These individuals' desire for Donald Trump to retain the presidency was more than a matter of partisan politics. It was quasi-religious in nature. To them, Trump wasn't just a politician. He was the messianic figure leading a crusade against a worldwide cabal of elite satanic pedophiles who preyed on children, sexually abusing them, and harvesting their blood for its chemical properties. These individuals were adherents of a conspiracy theory known as QAnon, and their participation in the insurrection of January 6, 2021, help highlight how conspiracy theories and their adherents can have very real and dangerous effects on our nation and its democratic processes. In this presentation, we're going to discuss the phenomenon of conspiracy theories, what they are, how they work, and why people believe in them. To do this, we're also going to explore the characteristics of very real and successful historical conspiracies to contrast the ways in which real historical conspiracies worked to the way conspiracy theorists think they do. So what are conspiracy theories? Oxford Languages defines a quote-unquote conspiracy theory as a belief that some covert but influential organization is responsible for a circumstance or event. So, how does QAnon work within this framework? Well, QAnon posits that a group of elites in politics and entertainment are involved in a worldwide program of sexual exploitation and murder of children to support an agenda of pedophilia and child murder for the harvesting of bodily fluids, the so-called quote-unquote adrenochrome, for nefarious purposes. As such, this cabal, or deep state, is responsible for the manufacturing of pu public opinion, the control of government, the mass kidnapping and abuse of children, the murder of government and law, law enforcement officials, and, if you will believe it, the rigging of the 2020 presidential election. So, a belief that some covert but influential organization is responsible for a circumstance or event? Check, check, and check. Now, there are a few characteristics that QAnon holds in common with other major conspiracy theories, and these should stand out as red flags whenever you see them. First, the idea of a seemingly all-powerful secretive group at the center manipulating events. Inevitably, this group seems to be large, with a potentially ridiculous number of individuals in on the plot for a very long time. As a few examples, consider the Flat Earth Theory, which would argue that basically all map makers, the entire aerospace industry, NASA, etc., have been in on this plot for the last 500 years at least. Uh, in the case of the anti-vax movement, you would argue that the vast majority of practitioners of modern medicine, including the pharmaceutical industry and the government, have been involved for at least the past century in a conspiracy. And lastly, for those who believe that the, that the moon landing was faked, uh, the argument would be that NASA and the Hollywood studios, at the very least, have been in on this for at least the last 50 years. The second characteristic that many conspiracy theories share is the idea of a nefarious, sometimes unspeakable goal. This can be difficult to tell in some cases. It's kind of difficult to consider what the um, idea behind hiding a flat earth would be, but perhaps it's to enthrone godless science or keep, a, keep us from knowing the true nature of the universe. In the case of the anti-vaccine movement, it's a little more straightforward, um, exposing our children to dangerous diseases and chemicals for profit. And in the case of those who believe the moon landing was faked, um, it seems to be that we were tricking the Soviets into thinking we got to the moon first, which would get extra funding for NASA. The final major characteristic that characterizes most conspiracy theories is the idea that these groups secretly behind um, the conspiracy, are able to foresee and manipulate events at will without the fear of unintended consequences. The idea that anything that happens is all a part of the plan. And this is how these theories account for and incorporate new information without becoming debunked. 
such as satellite data for flat earthers, um, or telescopic Im images of the moon landing sites, or the retraction of scholarly papers accusing the MMR vaccine of causing autism, etc. All of this is apparently foreseen and prepared for by those who are causing the conspiracy. While the ultimate conclusions conspiracy theories jump to may seem outlandish, they do, however, tend to take advantage of real events or seemingly self-evident truths to justify the wild leap to their wilder claims. For example, the Flat Earth Movement takes advantage of the fact that few of us have traveled far enough to truly appreciate the size of the world and relies on so-called common sense arguments on how the world doesn't see it feel curved and the Australians don't fall off, etc. On the other hand, the anti-vaccine movement can take advantage of a long and ugly history of errors, mistakes, and cover-ups in modern medicine, and particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, where interest and profits did indeed endanger and cost lives. A few examples include the prescription of thalidomide as an anti-nausea drug to pregnant mothers in the 1960s. It was prescribed without realizing that it would cause massive birth defects in the children that these women were carrying. Or the manufacturing of the Dalcon Shield, an intrauterine uh, anticonception device that spread massive infections and whose design grievously maimed many of the women who had it implanted in them. And while those who claim the moon landing was faked can't point to any other fake planetary landings in NASA history as proof, post-Watergate revelations about the many shady covert dealings of the CIA, FBI, and other government agencies make the possibility of NASA doing similar shenanigans much easier to believe now than it might have been in 1969. Among these many revelations, one that boggles the mind, is the CIA's MKUltra program in which to test the possibility of using LSD as a mind control drug, they would spike the drinks of men at brothels, houses of prostitution, to see what the effects of LSD would be upon them. And the funny thing is, is while I'm saying this, despite the fact that this has been attested to in congressional testimony and evidence and documentary evidence brought forth that confirms that this was done, I still feel crazy telling you about it. Generally speaking, conspiracy theories view history or at least selected major events in history, as being wholly manufactured and manipulated by a hidden few for their own unseen purposes. In the words of Richard Hofstadter, an American historian in the mid-20th century, the distinguishing characteristic of believers in conspiracy theories is not that its exponents see conspiracies or plots here and there in history, but that they regard a vast or gigantic conspiracy set in motion by demonic forces of almost transcendent power, and what is felt to be needed to defeat it is not the usual methods of political give and take, but instead an all-out crusade. Now, whatever you want to believe about conspiracy theories, conspiracies themselves do exist, and there have been historical events triggered by conspiratorial behavior. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary defines conspiracies as follows. A secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. By this definition, I think we could consider the following scenarios the results of successful or relatively successful conspiracies. So let's look at a few of these very real historical conspiracies and see how they compare with the conspiracy theories we've just talked about. First, March 15th, 44 BCE, in the city of Rome. A group of 60 Roman senators, including Cassius and Marcus Junius Brutus, await the arrival of the recently declared dictator for life, Gaius Julius Caesar. They have conspired in secret to plan and carry out the assassination of Caesar in order to put an end to his dictatorship and restore the Senate to power over the Roman Republic. While several of these members of the conspiracy are personal enemies of Caesar, they also include old friends, including Brutus, who Caesar considered a personal friend. Ultimately, fear of Caesar's continually expanding power, he was now considered a king in all but name, won out over friendship. Upon Caesar's arrival, without his bodyguards per custom in the Senate, he was swarmed by senators carrying petitions and conspirators carrying knives. Acting on a cry from one of their number, the conspirators struck, stabbing Caesar 23 times. The dictator was dead. So, a successful conspiracy, right? Well, yes and no. Caesar may have been dead, but his armies, his soldiers, and his lieutenants, such as Mark Antony and his nephew Octavian, were still alive and primed for revenge. 
In the resulting Liberators' War, the conspirators were hunted down and executed. The subsequent struggle for power between Octavian and Antony led to Octavian's victory and position, much like his late uncle, as sole master of Rome, a position he would hold for decades as Augustus, the first Roman emperor. The Senate was reduced to a merely ceremonial body. The conspirators had succeeded in killing Caesar, but they could not foresee that in doing so, they had ensured the death of the republic they had sought to save. Next up, we're going to take a little trip to the theater on April 14, 1865, in Washington, D.C. Just five days after the end of the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln is enjoying a rare, relaxing night on the town. Accompanied by his wife, Mary, Major Henry Rathbone, and his fiancée, Clara Harris, he sits in a balcony box at Ford's Theater watching Our American Cousin, a comedy. John Wilkes Booth enters the theater at around 10.10 p.m. As a noted stage actor from a famous theatrical family, Booth is hardly out of place at the theater despite his avowed Confederate sympathies. However, his purpose at this theater tonight is political, not artistic. Over the past several months, Booth has gathered together a group of six fellow Confederate sympathizers with the goal of killing Lincoln and other key Union leaders in order to halt the Union's successful campaigns against the Confederacy. With General Lee's surrender at Appomattox on April 9th, the conspiracy's goal changed to vengeance for the fallen South and the hopes of potentially reigniting Southern rebellion. At approximately 10.15 p.m., John Wilkes Booth sneaked past the men guarding the presidential box and fired his Derringer pistol into the back of Lincoln's head at close range. After a brief fight with Major Rathbone, in which Rathbone was injured by Booth's dagger, Booth leapt the 12 feet from the box to the stage, tangling his spurs in a flag during his fall and injuring his foot. While accounts conflict, it is traditionally thought that he cried out the state motto of his native Virginia, Sic Semper Tyrannus, thus always to tyrants, upon landing on the stage and then, The South is avenged! before fleeing the theater. Abraham Lincoln would die of his injuries at 7.22 a.m. the following day. So once again, a successful conspiracy, right? Well, in this case, not really. Lincoln's death would be mourned, and his absence during the process of Reconstruction would lead to generations of what-ifs, but did not ultimately change the fact of the Confederacy's defeat or the South's occupation. Furthermore, while Booth had succeeded in killing his primary target, his fellow conspirators weren't so lucky. Lewis Powell, who had been tasked with killing Secretary of State William Seward, managed to break into Seward's home and stabbed him, but was forced to flee. Seward would be seriously wounded, but live. George Astorot, who was tasked to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson, got drunk and wandered off. The final target, Union General Ulysses S. Grant, was supposed to be at the theater with Lincoln, but chose not to attend as Mrs. Grant and Mrs. Lincoln did not get along. Within the space of a few hours, Booth and his co-conspirators became the most wanted men and women in America, and were eventually hunted down, suffering fates similar to Brutus and his co-conspirators 1900 years before. Last off, let's take a little trip to Petrograd, Russia, on April 16, 1917. A train pulls into Finland Station, Petrograd, Russia, with a sealed car. Within that car are 32 Russian citizens, relocated to Russian soil, courtesy of the Russians' current enemy, the German Empire. The car is sealed to prevent the passengers from contaminating German troops and citizens as it traveled across Germany from Switzerland. But in this case, the contamination isn't bacterial or viral. It's ideological. The passengers are members of the Bolshevik wing of the Russian Social Democratic Party, and they are accompanying their leader, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin, on his first journey home since he entered exile 17 years before. This is a slightly different conspiracy than the ones we've dealt with before. It's a little larger and international in flavor. By 1917, the German Empire, despite being surrounded by the Entente powers, had managed to hold on to a large chunk of Belgium and France, and had the Russian Empire on the ropes. In February 1917, Tsar Nicholas had been overthrown, but the new Russian Republic, despite its chronic instability, vowed to continue to fight. At the same time, due to the renewal of unrestricted submarine warfare, the United States, long neutral in the war, entered the conflict on the side of the Entente. Germany wouldn't have the manpower to meet the vast reserves of American troops its enemies could now expect, 
and it needed to end the war soon, which would require the removal of the ailing enemy to their east, so they could focus all their forces on the destruction of the Western Allies in 1918. Enter Lenin. Following the fall of the Tsar, the German high command approached the Bolshevik leader and offered him and his fellow exiles a ride home, on the condition that he marshal his party to destabilize and overthrow the Russian Republic. Seeing a golden opportunity, Lenin agreed, took the sealed train, and arrived in Petrograd that April to drive the Bolshevik party into a revolutionary frenzy, ultimately leading to the overthrow of the provisional government that October by a group led by the Bolsheviks. By early 1918, Russia was out of the war, and the Germans could turn their attentions west for the largest offensives they had conducted since 1914. So, clearly, a successful conspiracy here, right? Well, yes, but my little narrative there oversimplified things by quite a bit. In April 1917, no one would have bet money on the Bolsheviks being the odds-on winners of a Russian revolution. They were a radical fringe party focused on the urban industrial workers in a nation made up mostly of rural peasants. In order for the October Revolution to work out the way it did, a number of things had to happen that were totally outside the powers of either Lenin or the Germans. In fact, during June and July of 1917, Lenin had to flee to Finland for a little while to avoid getting arrested, and the Bolsheviks almost rejected the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which got Russia out of the war and let the Germans turn west. Furthermore, while the conspiracy turned out relatively well for Lenin, the same couldn't have been said for the German high command. Despite having eliminated Russia, their offensives in the West ultimately failed, and facing an entente growing daily with American reinforcements, they surrendered. However, the truly unintended consequence of the High Command's choice to put Lenin on that train wouldn't be felt for another 27 years, when the troops of the Soviet Union, the nation that Lenin and his successors would build on the ashes of the Russian Empire, would storm into Berlin and utterly destroy the old Reich's Nazi successor state. So conspiracies exist, and they can actually be successful in their goals. But even when they're successful, they're a lot different from the way conspiracy theorists portray them. First off, none of these conspiracies were huge affairs with hundreds, if not thousands, of participants upholding a secret across generations. Brutus's conspiracy had 60 members, and Booth's had only seven. While the conspiracy between Lenin and the Germans was certainly larger, it didn't extend to the whole of the German army or government, and none of these conspiracies stayed secret very long. Even Lenin was unmasked as a German operative within a few weeks of his arrival back in Russia. Second, each of these conspiracies focused on a main, short-term goal. While wider goals of world revolution or world domination may have played a role in the last scenario, Lenin's primary focus in 1917 was to overthrow the government and the Germans was to get Russia out of the war. Brutus and Booth's immediate goals both involved in assassinations, removing the person that stood in the way of their higher goals. Finally, the achievement of any conspiracy's short-term goals did not ensure fulfillment of their long-term ones. Indeed, in the case of Brutus and his followers, it basically ensured their failure. But each case, these successful conspiracies didn't demonstrate any foreknowledge of how events would take place, and indeed their ignorance, or inability to adapt to unforeseen consequences, led to their ultimate undoing. So successful conspiracies in history don't look anything like the scenarios the conspiracy theorists describe. Why then do people believe in them? Well, there are a variety of reasons for why people believe in conspiracy theories. The historian Richard Hofstadter laid out a theory on why conspiracy theories appealed to people in an essay he wrote for Harper's Magazine in 1964 titled The Paranoid Style in American Politics. Drawing on examples from the 19th century, Hofstadter identified the following characteristics that he described as forming the paranoid style or worldview. First, a feeling of persecution, directed not only at oneself, but at a nation, a culture, or a way of life that doesn't just affect oneself, but millions of others. Second, a sense that one's political passions are unselfish and patriotic, amplifying feelings of righteousness and moral indignation. Third, a feeling of cultural dispossession, that America has been quote-unquote largely taken away from them and their kind, and though they are determined to try to repossess it and prevent the final destructive act of subversion. And finally, a conviction that events occurring around us 
are, co- are a consequence not of accidents, incompetence, or mistakes, but of a treasonous conspiracy. The idea that it wasn't just random events that caused this, all of this was planned in advance. In addition to Hofstadter's observations, I might add that, in the midst of rising social tension, economic equality, and the worst pandemic in living memory, one of the major appeals for conspiracy theories right now might actually be that the idea that everything that is happening is the planned result of an all-powerful organization is preferable to the alternative. Terrifying as it might be to consider ourselves to be the pawns of shadowy cabals pursuing nefarious schemes, it may actually be less terrifying than the truth that our problems stem from complex systemic issues interacting with random, unpredictable events. On the one hand, you can point to your enemy and fight with them. On the other hand, you find yourself at the mercy of a mindless, uncaring universe whose affliction or persecution of you is entirely impersonal and potentially unstoppable. Caught between the grinding wheels of history at this moment in time, we might do well to remember the words of the historian Louis B. Namier, who stated that, quote, the crowning achievement of historical study is to achieve an intuitive sense of how things do not happen, unquote, and reject the tantalizing yet ultimately deluded fantasies offered to explain why things are the way they are.